You're good? Or dizzy? I'm still. Just, I'm dizzy now. This is, this is great. Stop closing in two of my fingers. Hmm? You keep doing that, and you're closing in two of my fingers, and that feels weird. And you guys are more than welcome to start entering into that room. Like, it hit me. She opened up the door, and I was like, oh, God. I told you the energy of this house is intense. You go first. <laughs> what, scared to see something through your phone? You might not see it right now. I just need to see first. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So for those who may not know, an EVP is an electronic voice phenomenon that is captured through audio recording. You would take any old audio recorder, go ahead, give some time for feedback, you would basically be having a conversation with the room. It might seem a little silly at first. Ask your questions and then go ahead, wait for your feedback. Once you were to stop that tape, we then go ahead and read that tape back, you might actually have some responses. Now, does everybody know typically what an EVP sounds like? For those who may not know, does anyone want to talk about what an EVP usually sounds like? Static. Static, exactly. Very staticky. Very hard to make out what's being said in any way, shape, or form. It's quite difficult. Now, they captured a very clear one, very long, and not a lot of editing went through it at all. And it was captured in the carriage house, and I will be playing that for you guys much later on this evening. Where we currently are, as I said, is Francis Sorrell's That's what Molly was it's saying. probably the least active room in the house. Oh, it's okay. Did they do it? Did you see the door? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, it was almost like the lighting I love now. I shall return them. I'll be right back. <laughs> she walked them out of the house. Yes, probably. Did you ever hear a knock at that window too? Yeah. Or am I just going crazy? Yeah, I didn't hear it. I heard it. All right, cool. I'm going crazy. I mean, no, I feel like I'm going to pass out right now. So the deal. I'm stuck here every day. I do 31 days of Halloween. So every day is different makeup and different outfits. It's a lot of fun. All right. So it is probably the most least active room in the house. This meaning that no, not nothing happens inside of this room. Some things do occur. However, most people do feel most comfortable in this room. This is where a lot of us tour guides feel most comfortable as well. As we continue on our tour tonight, it's going to get much spookier in a fun way, but it is going to get much darker as well. Now, a little bit of background information on the home. You're going to hear about Francis Sorrell again and Antoine. 
but some other people as well, just so you know who might be among us this evening. This house is a Greek revival mansion built between 1838 to 1840. It was commissioned to be built by a gentleman here. That is what Francis Sorrell would have looked like. As I said, he was born in St. Domingue in 1793. That today is what we refer to as Haiti. He was born from a French nobleman named Antoine Sorrell and a free woman of color named Eugenia. Unfortunately, two weeks after Francis' birth, Eugenia did pass away. And then, as I said earlier as well, Antoine also fled and left Santa Domingue, leaving Francis behind. He left due to a huge uprising when slaves were reclaiming their freedom, where Antoine would have most likely met his demise, so he simply just left his, left his son. Now, despite Francis' mixed race, he is very fair-skinned. We do believe that he would have been kept hidden with his mother's family throughout the majority of his early childhood, but Along the way, he met a couple of shipping merchants who then taught him English. They brought him over to the United States, and they taught him everything that they knew about the shipping merchant business, which is how Francis acquired all of his wealth. Not only did they just show him all of these things, but they also introduced him to his first wife, Lucinda Moxley. Lucinda and Francis were married for five years, and they bore three children together. But after that fifth year of marriage, Lucinda did pass away due to devil's disease, yellow fever, which is all what we talked about much earlier in the tour as well. But now Francis was in need of another wife. Men during this time were not looked at as being the sole caretakers of children. So the family that he married into just went ahead and said, well, why don't you just marry our younger daughter, Matilda Moxley, now Matilda Sorrell. This is clearly much more contract than having anything to do with love. But, however, for the time period, Matilda did fulfill her wifely duties. She and Francis bore eight children together, but only five of them survived past childhood. The eldest of the three that did pass away was Matilda Ann. She was six years old when Scarlet Fever took her life upstairs in the children's quarters. Now, I share this with you as well because Matilda obviously dealt a very hard hand throughout her existence. She was contractually married to her brother-in-law two years after her sister's death. That is not a lot of time for grief and mourning in any way, shape, or form. And then after losing her sister, marrying him, she lost three children as well throughout her life. And it's important for me to note that Matilda was known for struggling with depression publicly. It was made known very outwardly, and a lot of people knew about it. And this is just a very small detail this evening to remember as our tour does continue on tonight. Now, as I said, this is the study. It's not very active. Francis had a lot of solitude in here, doing a lot of work. Now, where we are about to start making our way to is 